Good morning, family, and welcome to those of you who are watching us on Facebook and YouTube or streaming on our website. We are delighted. We are honored to have you with us today here at Faith Outreach Community Church on another Sunday morning. It's a very beautiful day outside, and I hope that you are enjoying the springtime of year. Uh, I'm going to take time to do a few announcements, not that many, for church life, uh, and I um, look forward to giving you the sermon here shortly. Uh, first of all, as far as praise reports, we did not receive any praise reports this week. So if something good, and we know it is, uh, is happening in your life, please take a moment and send us an email either to me or to uh, Pastor Melinda and just so we can include it and let the church knows, know what's going on in your life. So right now, we did not receive any praise reports. Um, prayer requests. Uh, many of you know Maurice Settles former member of our congregation. Maurice Settles recently suffered a stroke, and I've heard it might have been two, and he's currently being treated at Washington Hospital Center. Uh, he is expected to recover, but will have to go through rehabilitation. Uh, please pray for his complete healing, and also pray for comfort and strength for his family. Again, that's for Maurice Settles, a former member of our congregation. I also want to bring you up to date on a couple of people that we've been praying for on our, on our prayer list. Uh, Pastor Wade continues to improve day by day. Um, it's always good to hear when people are continually improving after undergoing a transplant surgery, but his kidney function is improving. For a time, he was on hemodialysis, but uh, I think they're starting to wean him off that because the kidneys seem to be functioning uh, very well, and it's improving, at least uh, daily. And, of course, he's losing weight, which is something he wants to do, and he appreciates everyone prayer, everyone's prayers on his behalf. That's for Pastor Wade. And last update is for uh, our deaconess, Maureen Griffin. She's still experiencing some side effects from the second uh, chemo, uh, therapy treatment that she received. Uh, however, the side effects are starting to subside a little bit. And just to remind you, those side effects include a numbness, a loss of appetite, and uh, a loss of taste. I'm talking uh, a little bit with Maureen yesterday about that. I didn't realize that how much she missed that. Uh, Maureen enjoys good food, as we all do, and when you're not able to enjoy good food, or especially like an Easter Sunday meal or whatever the case may be, it's really frustrating. So uh, uh, she would appreciate your prayers uh, that she will continue to improve in that area. Uh, she's still losing some weight, so uh, please keep Deaconess Maureen Griffin in your prayers uh, and to continue to pray for God's mercy and his grace on her behalf. And as far as general announcements, uh, women's ministry will be having a meeting on next Saturday at 1 p.m. on Zoom. All ladies are encouraged to join in. Uh, please contact uh, Deaconess uh, Chris McGill if you are interested, and an invitation will be sent out in the coming week. The title of today's sermon is Don't Judge Others, Judge, judge Yourself. And this is going to be a two-part sermon. Again, part one is Don't Judge Others, Judge Yourself, part one. Uh, we are entering, believe it or not, the last section or last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. We have been on this journey for over a year, approaching a year and a half. Uh, and since it's been so long since ago since we started this series of sermons on the Sermon on the Mount, I, wanna, I thought it would be good just to take a quick look at the ground that we've covered thus far. The Sermon on the Mount covers a lot of material, a lot of material. And there are major themes, so let me just kind of give you a brief overview or outline of the things that we've been covering in this particular sermon. And by the way, I always encourage you to go back and read the whole sermon and follow what Jesus is teaching us because it's rich in terms of helping us to understand how to live a kingdom life right now, right now. Beginning in chapter 5, remember the Sermon on the Mount covers chapter 5 of Matthew, chapter 6, and chapter 7. But chapter 5 covers, uh, begins in verses 1 through 12 by talking about Christian character. There we, we, of course, talk about the Beatitudes and so on. 
Then verses 13 through 16, we talk about the Christian influence, salt and light and things of that nature. Then in the Christian righteousness is talked about in verses 17 down to verse 48 of Matthew chapter 5. And then when we switch over to chapter 6 of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about the Christian's motivation. That covers the entire chapter of chapter 6 of Matthew. Now as we move into chapter 7, uh, in verses 1 to, through 12, Jesus talks about the Christian relationships. And down to, uh, to verse 13, down to 27, he talks about the Christian destiny. The Christian's relationship, which we're going to begin this morning, breaks down into two parts. Our relationship with others and our relationship with God. And for the next couple of sermons, we're going to focus on our relationship with others. And specifically, family, we're going to look at this subject of judging. Judging. And this can be kind of a sensitive subject. I'm going to step on some toes, including my own. Because, believe it or not, religious people are notorious for being judges. Religious people are notorious for looking down on or judging other people, whether they're Christian or non-Christian. And Jesus had to address that because that is a problem when it comes to relationships. If you really want to understand how we can get along in our church, our family, our community, or whatever the case may be, listen to this sermon today. What does it mean to judge? What does it mean to judge? Is it wrong to judge? Is it wrong? Are we allowed to make judgments at all? Or, or does Jesus forbid judging, period? The lesson Jesus is going to teach us in this section of the Sermon on the Mount is a simple one. Don't judge others. Judge yourself. Don't judge others. Judge yourself. And again, this is part one of this segment. Uh, part one, uh, we will deal with this today, and part two will be the next time I speak with you. Let's read our text, and then we will have a word of prayer. I'm going to read verses 1 down to verse 6, but our main sermon today is only going to cover verses 1 and 2. But just to get the whole context of what Jesus is talking about, and context is critically important when you talk about any segment of scripture, so often people will pull a, pull a text totally out of context, use it in whatever statement they want to make or teaching they want to give, but the context doesn't support what's being talked about here. But let's read the whole context of what Jesus is saying, but do understand our message today will be focusing on verses 1 and 2. Jesus began Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 uh, with this, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother or sister, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Again, the focus is going to be verse 1 and 2. I'm going to read it one more time before we pray. Jesus says, do not judge. Do not judge. Or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Again, the title of our message is, do not judge others. Don't judge others. Judge yourself. Let's pray. Holy Father, we come in your presence here this morning again. Thank you so, so very much for 
the goodness and grace that you show to us each and every day. We thank you that you are a merciful God, a righteous God, a God who knows all of our faults and all of our sins. Yet, through Jesus Christ, you have covered them all and you don't hold things against us. You don't dig up our past. You don't throw things at us because of things that we do or done in the past or do even present because you are a merciful and a kind God. And we thank you so much for setting that perfect example of a loving God. We thank you for being our father and for being the one who made provisions for all of our sins, past, present, and future. But so often, we as Christians haven't learned what it's like to love others as ourselves, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to love our brother or our sister as ourselves. And so often, even as Christians, we find ourselves judging one another. And Jesus is teaching us here in the Sermon on the Mount how we can get along, how we can get along in our families, how we can get along in our society, how we can get along in our church. And if we can just follow this one principle, this one principle of not being judgmental, and truly it'll be a much better world, a much better church, a much better family relationship, and all the things that you want people to have in order to exist in society can be summed up in that statement, that command. So bless the word that goes forth today, God in heaven. Just remove me out of the way and speak to us the things that you would have us to grasp from the words of Jesus himself. Thank you so much for this wonderful principle. May we truly apply it in our lives. And Holy Spirit, we confess that we can't do it on our own because we're just not wired right. But because you live in and through us, empower and enable us to not be judgmental, not to have that type of spirit, but to have a loving spirit. Thank you for it all. And we ask it in Jesus' name we pray. Together we say amen. Amen. All right, family. Let's roll up our sleeves and get started with this important subject because it is a monumental subject. And so many of these messages in the Sermon on the Mount, I find that when I study them, I don't just study them to give a message to you. I study them because it speaks to me. It's corrective at times to me uh, because of what Jesus is saying. Not just at times, all the time it's corrective to me because what Jesus is saying is life changing, life transformational. And I do believe that the subject that we are speaking at today is transformational, life transformational to everybody listening to us today. You know, if Christians, and I want to get something out of the way before we really get to the nuts and bolts of what we want to get to. If Christians were to pick their favorite verse in the Bible, I think most Christians would go to John 3, uh, 16, where Jesus said, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and on and on we go. Everybody's familiar with that verse. We see it on placards and games and so on. Many people can quote it by heart. Many people even know where it is. And that's a favorite verse for Christians. John 3, 16. But if you were to ask the world what is their favorite verse in the Bible, many of them would pick uh, or probably pick the verse we read in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1. Do not judge. Do not judge. And the reason they will pick that verse is because many people feel that Christians judge them too much. Uh, and maybe they are doing something that you would say is worthy of judgment. Who knows? But Christians are notorious for finding fault with people or judging people and so on and so on. So oftentimes people in the world will go to this passage of Matthew 1, 7, 1 is, and, say, and can quote, do not judge. Now, not many people know their Bibles that well, but it seems that everyone knows that particular verse or passage. And they may not even know where it can be found, but they can still quote it. And they quote it oftentimes, <laughs> Well, frequently, the problem is they don't know the context of what Jesus is saying. They don't know the full context. And I told you earlier, context is so, so important. It is not only one of the most frequently quoted verses today, but it's also one of the most misunderstood passages. Uh, the other problem is that when people tell you do not judge, they are usually judging you. When they say that, don't, don't, do not judge me. You can't judge me. You can't judge. But now you're saying that I'm judging you. When you say that, you're judging me. 
So some people want to apply, do not judge, even to God. Not only can you not judge me, no one can judge me. Even God can't judge me. Now since this verse is so often used out of context, we should begin by answering uh, that question. What does Jesus mean by do not judge? What does he mean by that? Well, first, when Jesus says do not judge, he does not prohibit making moral judgment. That's not what he's talking about. That is discerning what's right or what's wrong uh, according to the word of God. And we have the, the word of God teaches us over and over and over again the right things to do or say and the wrong things to do or say. Now, we know this because in other places in the Bible, the Bible actually, it actually requires us to make moral judgments. So that's not what Jesus is talking about. It's not wrong to make moral judgments. In fact, in this very chapter of Matthew chapter 7, later on, uh, in, in the same chapter, Jesus will tell us to make a moral judgment. I read it earlier in the scripture reading. Verse 6, he tells us not to give to dogs what is sacred or throw your pearls to pigs or hogs. So you got to be careful with dogs and you got to be careful with hogs. So in order to not throw, uh, give what's sacred to dogs or throw your pearls to pigs, you got to make a judgment. That's a judgment that Jesus is saying we need to make. Then later on in verse 15, down to verse 20, he tells us to watch out for false prophets. And you know, that's a judgment. When you say someone is a false prophet, you are making a judgment that that person is not truthful. So judgments are made all the time. Uh, and we wouldn't be able to obey these commands unless we were allowed to make moral judgments as to what is right and what is wrong. In John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus says, stop judging mere appearances and make a right judgment. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, Paul writes, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. We're talking judgments. Judgments are to be made. So as Christians, we are required to make moral judgments, uh, correctly discerning. That's an important word. You got to have discernment. Some people don't have a good discernment. They can't discern right up from wrong. And discernment is so important. So we need to make correctly discern what's right and what's wrong according to the word of God. Ironically, although this is not what Jesus means in Matthew 7, 1, by that verse, this is the way that most people who quote it will interpret it. The thing that Jesus is saying is you can't, uh, is saying you can't, uh, uh, th this thing that Jesus is saying, you can't call sin, sin, that you can't uh, comment on moral behavior, that you can't judge someone else's action is wrong. They, that's what they think, and that's not what he's saying. They think that's what he's saying. The problem is, if you can't judge something as being wrong, then you can't judge it as being right either. One way or the other, but judgment has to be made. And so if the same people who says, do not judge, when we make a moral judgment that a certain action is wrong, they're also judging when you make the moral judgment that a certain action is right. So when Jesus says, do not judge, he does not prohibit making moral judgments. The word judge in the Bible has a lot of meaning, a lot of meanings. And that's the critical thing we have to understand. A lot of meanings. So what did Jesus mean by it? What is he actually forbidding us from doing? What is he telling us do not do? What he is forbidding family is this. He is commanding us not to have a critical judgmental spirit. A critical judgmental spirit. He is not talking about evaluating behavior, but rather condemning people or looking down on others. Whether that person sinned or not. He says not to have a critical judgmental spirit. 
The Message Bible gives it this way or puts it this way. Don't pick on people. Jump on their failures or criticize their faults. Don't do that. That's what God doesn't want us to do. Because if we have a judgmental spirit, I'm here to tell you, you're not going to get along in your family. You're not going to get along in your church. And you're not going to get along in society. You won't get along at work. And today we're talking about how to get along with one another. How to get along in relationships. You can't have a judgmental spirit, a critical spirit, uh, a, um, a, 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 a condemning spirit, if you want to get along with other people. And Jesus says, don't do that. That's the judgment he's talking about. We find a good example of this in Romans chapter 14, verse 10, when Paul says, why do you judge your brother? Why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we all, I'm sorry, for we will all stand before God's judgment seat. I like that verse because that's exactly the point Jesus is making. Why do we judge one another? And religious folks are very guilty of this. You want to know what turns many people off from church or churches? Because people are judgmental. When people, and, and there's not a human that walks this earth that does not have faults. <laughs> I strongly include myself. And you do too. But when you walk into a church and you have a fault, usually how many people operate is this. They go to church, but they conceal their faults. But when someone has a fault that is not concealed, I guarantee you, they're going to be judged by somebody. They're going to be judged by somebody. And that's what really turns people off from church folk. Because we, when we get religious, we get judgmental. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus is addressing that subject today. You want to get along with people? Don't be judgmental. Don't be critical. Don't look down on your brother. Again, Romans 14, verse 10. Let me quote it one more time. And Paul, all he's doing, in, and oftentimes when Jesus, what Jesus gave on the Sermon on the Mount is expounded through the other writings of Scripture. Whether it's through Peter, James, John, and even Paul. They just expound it even more. Verse 10 of Romans 14, Paul says, why do you judge your brother? And don't tell me you don't do it. Because we all do it. We all do it. Why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? We will all stand before God's judgment seat. Because, you know, we get a little bit righteous on our own way. Uh, we, you know, we, we got this down. And when we see somebody else doing something wrong, we tend to look down. And when we look down, what are we doing to ourselves? We are exalting ourselves. Exalting ourselves. We lift ourselves up by looking down on other people. And so Jesus in this verse, in Matthew 7, 1, uh, does not prohibit us from making moral judgment. This is right or this is wrong. Because we have to discern right from wrong. You got to teach your children right from wrong. We must teach God's commandments. That's what we're supposed to do. We must proclaim the truth. He's not saying we can't do that. But he does forbid us from having a critical judgment spirit that exalts ourselves while looking down on other people. That's the problem. That's what causes people not to get along. But we judge one another. And that a, was a constant problem back then with the Pharisees and the scribes. Jesus is hitting them right between the eyeballs because this was their problem. And ladies and gentlemen, my, brother, my dear brothers and sisters, we got the same problem here today in our church, in any church. You can walk in churches, you can feel people just looking at you. If you don't dress right, you don't look a certain way, you don't talk a certain way, you don't handle yourself in the right way. If you do this, if this is glaring, it's something, if your hair's not combed right, you know, if you don't have a tie on, you don't have a suit on, you know, we judge people. We do that. And it's, it, 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 you know, I'm a pastor and it makes me sick when it happens. It makes me sick when I do it. But that's a constant problem in the religious community. That's a problem today as well. Religious people are especially guilty of judging. Next, Jesus goes on to tell us why we should not judge other people. And understand, 
Why, what he's talking about is why we should not be critical, look down on other people. And he gives us four reasons. And we're going to look at two of them today. And the next two, we're going to look at the next time I speak. So why does Jesus forbid us from having a critical, judgmental spirit that exalts ourselves while looking down on other people? The first reason he gives us is a very simple one. You're not the judge. I'm not the judge. None of us have been called to be judged. I'm not talking about what's going to happen in the millennium. Certainly Jesus may turn certain things over to us to be judgmental, be, uh, make judgment in that situation. But right here and now, we are not the judge. You are not the judge. I'm not the judge. Verse 1 says, do not judge or you too will be judged. And that's an interesting way he puts it. But what some, uh, what some say, what he's simply saying is, uh, you are not the judge. I said, don't judge because uh, you are taking a prerogative that's of God's. God is a judge. We're not the judge. If you're going to, uh, uh, if you are going to be judged, then yourself, then that means that uh, if, 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 if you're going to judge, then that means that you are, uh, in other words, you can't judge because you're not the judge. God is the judge. I'm sorry. You're not the judge. God is the judge. And that's so critical that we understand that. Now, unfortunately, some people like to set themselves up not only as a judge, but the jury and the executioner. Uh, they have a harsh, critical spirit. And I know you know what I'm talking about. You've been around people like that. Maybe you're like that. I don't know. But there are people who always look down on the faults of other people. They like to play the role of judge. Judge. Um, but there's a reason why God is the judge and we're not. <laughs> Jesus said again, I quote to you verse uh, 1. He says, do not judge. But you're gonna, you, you too are going to be judged. We're going to be judged too. Okay, so we got to keep that in mind. We are not, do not judge. We're going to be judged. And there's a reason why God is the judge and we're not. First of all, we're not qualified to be a judge. Let's face it. Let's just be honest. There's not a one of us who are listening today are qualified to be a judge. Why? Because we don't know other people's history. And that's very important. Until you know a person's history, what they went through, what they're going through, we're not qualified to be the judge of anybody. We don't know their background. We don't know the circumstances, the extenuating circumstances surrounding their lives. We don't know what they're going through at home. We don't know what they're going through on the job. We don't know what they're going through in their families. We don't know their struggles. We don't know how far they've come. And most of all, we don't know the other person's motivation or their motives behind why they do what they do. Uh, and, uh, and, and now we can see their actions. We can see what they outwardly do. But we don't know their hearts. I'm going to share with you an example that I think we can all relate to. And I, I prayed about this and I hope no one. Um, I, I'm saying this not to step on anyone's toes, but I know I'm going to, including my own. We used to have a member in our church who struggled with smoking. Let me be clear before I go further. Smoking will not keep you out of heaven. Now, it may take you there a little quicker than you expected, but it will not keep you out of heaven. Because I'm here to tell you, there's nothing that we do that keeps us out of heaven, except not accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. But this member struggled with smoking. He had been smoking for years and years and years and years and years. And it's very, it was very difficult. I've had several conversations with this person. He just could not stop. He wanted to. He tried. He threw packs away. And many times when people struggle with smoking, they do that. They throw packs away and what have you. But he simply could not stop. And family, I'm here to tell you, we were brutal to this brother. We really were. And it breaks my heart when I think about some of the stuff he went through. Because many times we're brutal because we didn't understand his history. You see, this is a brother who went through a lot in the military. He had PTSD. Uh, he had all kinds of problems going on. 
a lot of issues. He had not, not only was smoking a problem, he had other issues going on. And oftentimes when people have anxiety and difficulties like that, they may turn to cigarettes as a, as a way to treat it. Am I saying that's the right thing to do? No, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm focusing on how we treat him. We were brutal to this brother. We judged him. We judged him based on one thing only, that cancer stick, what we saw. And that's a dangerous type of judgment because all we're doing is judging appearances. We never stop to understand why can't he stop? Now, I've never been a smoker except casually, <laughs> clowning around with it as a kid, but I never, I, I never took it seriously, never tried it uh, hardcore, but I know people who have, and I know how difficult it is to stop. You may say, well, Pastor, I've known people to stop cold turkey. That's them. I'm talking about this one brother who struggled, struggled, and struggled. And you know why some, pipe, some people could not get along with this brother? is because they judged him based on that one situation that was obvious. Never stop to think about why it was so difficult for him to stop. And how much he wanted to stop. In fact, he wanted to stop more than we wanted him to stop. I've had those conversations with him. And he just couldn't. And he kept wondering whether God would ever forgive him. Will he go to hell because of the smoke? I can't tell you how many times he asked me that very question. And that's why I begin this segment by saying, you will not stay out of heaven because of smoking. He's in heaven right now, I guarantee that. But I'm more concerned about the impact it had on our relationship with him. Now, if what I said today is corrective or, or, or stepping on toes, then so be it because I'm stepping on mine too. Because I judged him. I judged him. And we've got to be careful of that. Because that's dangerous to relationships. And Jesus today is talking to us how we can get along with one another. We live in society that's constantly judging one another. This political climate we go in, everybody, if you're, if you're a Republican, you're judging the Democrats. If you're a Democrat, you're judging the Republicans. Just leave that stuff alone. Stop judging. Stop being critical. If, let people be what they want to be, if that's what they want to do. Because none of that stuff at the end of the day is going to make a hill of beans worth of difference whether or not you go to heaven. Because I'm here to tell you right now, there will be Democrats in heaven, there will be Republicans in heaven. There will be Democrats in hell and there will be Republicans in hell. What you better get straight is following the instructions of Jesus Christ on how to get along with one another. How to build relationships. Paul makes this statement in Romans 14, 4. Who are you? Who are, and I can kind of picture, I, you know, I grew up in, in the South. And when somebody say something and they want to make it clear, they will look you straight in the eye. They say, who are you to judge someone else's servant? Who am I to judge this brother because he smokes a cigarette? He says, to his own master, he stands or fall. What right do we have to judge somebody? He doesn't belong to us. He belongs to Jesus Christ. We have no right. Again, we're not the judge. That's the point he's making, family. We are not the judge. We aren't qualified to judge. Only God can judge perfectly. He knows our history. He knows our background. He knows our struggle. He knows our motivation. He knows why it's so hard. For this person to do to stop doing what they're doing. And we read in James 4, verse 11 and 12. Anyone who speaks against his brother or sister uh, or judges him speaks against the law and judge it. <laughs> Let me give that to you again because I don't know if you heard me. James 4, verse 11 and 12. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks 
against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. So what, God, gee, what, what Apostle James is saying is that when you judge another person, you're not only uh, doing something you shouldn't be doing because you're not the judge, you're also judging the law. Hmm, that's interesting. How can we be judging the law when we're judging someone else? Because what does the law command us that we do? Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. But when we judge someone, we're not loving them. We're judging them. So we're basically saying that the law is no good here. Because I'm going to judge this brother. And the law said we need to love our brother as ourselves. And then he goes on to say there is only one lawgiver and judge. The one who is able to save and destroy. But you. Who are you to judge your neighbor? I don't know about you. I'm feeling it. <laughs> I'm feeling it even as I read it. James said there's only one lawgiver and judge. And it's not you, brothers and sisters. And it's not me. It's not me. James says when, we, when you speak against your brother, you're not only judge, uh, that you are not only judging your brother, but you're also judging the law. You're basically saying the law is no good. It's no good. And it's not good enough to love your brother. I got to judge him. So you're saying what God says doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. I know God says love your brothers yourself, but love, uh, love your neighbors yourself, but that's not good enough. I got to judge him. So you're judging the law. The law tells us to love your neighbor as yourself. And when you speak against your neighbor, you are no longer loving them, but you're judging them. And when you set yourself up as a judge, you make yourself out to be better than other people. And there's two problems with that. First of all, we're not better than other people. We're not better than other people. You know, I've been in the ministry for, I have to stop and think for a moment, almost 40 years. Um, and over the years, I spent a lot of time just watching people, observing people including myself. Uh, and I see a lot of people um, just, just observing people. There are a lot of people who, when they come to church, uh, like I said, they, uh, we oftentimes put our best foot forward, wear a mask, we try to put forth this facade that we got it all together. But I know for a fact, there's not one person that goes to a church that doesn't have faults. Everybody has faults. How do I know that? Because we're fallen human beings. Now, my fault may be different from your fault. My fault might be worse than your fault. But the fact of the matter is, we all have faults. Faults that could take us to hell. But the blood, shed blood of Jesus Christ covers all of that. But when a fault is obvious, it really gets a whole lot of judgment. So, the point I'm making is that we're no better than any other, any other person. That's the number one point. And secondly, uh, we are failing to love our neighbor as ourselves. You can't love and judge at the same time. You can't do it. Now, why shouldn't you judge others? Why shouldn't we? The first reason Jesus gives us is because we are not the judge. We, that's why we shouldn't do it. We just need, might as well say that to ourselves. I'm not your judge. Uh, yes, is it wrong to do that? Yes, but I'm not your judge. You know, I'm not going to condemn you. That's between you and God. There's a second reason. As I say, we're going to do two today and then two the next time. The second reason, Jesus says, because God will judge us the same way we judge others. God will judge us the same way we judge others. Look at verse two. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Huh, that's interesting. So let me just ask this question. Are you harsh and overbearing toward other people? Then God will judge you harshly. If you, do you judge people and don't consider uh, their history? Then maybe God won't consider your history. Do you judge people and don't 
consider the fact that you've been through some difficult times in the military or whatever the case may be, maybe God won't consider that when judging you. Are you loving and merciful toward others? Then God will be loving and merciful toward you. Do you have a generous spirit? Overlooking the faults of others. Dear my brothers and sisters, then isn't that the kind of judge you want in your life? Someone is going to be generous in spirit, overlooking my faults. Now, God says he's ready to do that. I don't know about you. I want him to do that for me. The Lord knows I give him a whole lot to judge me harshly. But I want him to be gracious and merciful unto me. I want mercy. I want mercy. And I believe you do too. Well, God says you want mercy in your life, then be merciful to others. Now, Jesus has already taught this principle several times throughout the scriptures, throughout the Sermon on the Mount as well. The rabbis spoke of two measures that God uses to judge people. The measure of justice and the measure of mercy. Which measure do you want other people to use on you? Or what, better yet, what measure do you use on other people? What measure do you want God to use with you? Well, I think everybody who can hear what I'm saying or talking about today, everybody wants God to use mercy rather than justice. Everybody wants that. And I'm glad that we have a merciful and yet a just God. But I'm so glad he's merciful. We want that. So what do we want? James 2, verse 12 and 13 says, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy, triumph over judgment. I love that. Oh, I need mercy. And I know you do as well. Once again, God urges us to be merciful to others rather than have a harsh or critical spirit. This is the second reason Jesus gives us why we should not be judging one another. Because God will judge us the same way. Two simple points for today. We are not the judge. God is the judge. God will judge us. Second point, God will judge us in the same way that we judge others. Next time, we're going to look at two more reasons why we sh should not be critical or judging other people. Just remember, my brothers and sisters, don't judge others. Just judge yourself. Don't judge others. Judge yourself. Let us pray. Holy Father, we come before you once again to thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for addressing this subject in the Sermon on the Mount because it is your desire... It's your will that we as families, as Christians, as a church community, as a society, learn to get along with one another. And one of the greatest barriers that wrecks our relationship is having a critical judgmental spirit by looking down on other people. When people walk around thinking they are better than other people to a self-righteous attitude, I believe that's one thing that really, truly is a stench in your nostrils. Thus, to be that way toward other people. Help us, Holy Father, not to be judgmental, not to be critical, but to realize that we all have faults, we all have weaknesses, we all have struggles, we all have baggage that we're having to deal with. And if everybody can be open to the fact that we are all we come to the foot of the cross realizing that everybody needs mercy that God provides. And if we can have that attitude that nobody is exempt from this, no one, uh, there's no one out there that this does not apply to, that everybody needs the covering of Jesus because of our fallen nature. And help us not to therefore look down on others, to find faults with others be critical of others or to think we're better than others just not judge one another thank you for your word today help us to live it and to apply it and holy spirit we ask that you minister to our hearts that we truly will walk in a way and live in a way in a way that brings glory to god and bring you honor in all that we say and do thank you so much for your word and we ask it in jesus name 
and our family as you go out throughout this week. I ask that you reflect on what we talked about here today. Reflect on the fact that the word of God tells us, do not judge. You can take that as a command. Do not be critical. Do not look down on other people. Do not exalt yourself as being better than someone because someone has an obvious glare, an obvious fault, an obvious speck, or whatever the case may be. Don't judge because number one, we are not the judge. And don't judge because we're gonna be judged in the same way, same measure that we use on others. God will use that on us. God bless you. May you walk in a spirit of mercy, kindness, and goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful week, family. God bless you. Thank you.